Please turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 3 through 19. John chapter 4, verses 3 through 19. He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you will have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then, you, where, where then do you go get the living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank it of himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him of a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me the water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have five husbands, and the only one whom now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are not a prophet. You are a prophet. March 15th was where we last left off in our study of the book of John. Like a lot of us, when we began 2020, we began with not only optimism, but we began with a lot of plans for the year. And my plan for the year was to textually study the book of John. And then came the coronavirus. And it was after March 15th that we stopped assembling for a period of time here at the church building, and we assembled exclusively online through our live streams. But then we started meeting back together again, and as I've mentioned to you in the past, I felt like there were some other lessons that perhaps we needed to address, some other topics that would be more uh, along the lines of what we needed to hear at this time, and so that's what we've been doing for the past four and a half months. But now we are going to get back into that study. And so several of you have been preparing to jump back into John chapter 4. When we last left off, we actually left off with verse 3 of chapter 4. But that's where we're going to begin again this morning. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a look at the very age-old story of the woman at the well. And we're going to begin with the very verse that we left off this morning as a part of our study because it's significant to the study that's going to be laid out uh, in this morning's lesson. You might notice on the board that this is part one. And that's because I did want to get you out of here before lunch. I am mindful of that, much to uh, some people's uh, dismay. But I do want you to understand that there are two very fundamental lessons. One is what Jesus does as he approaches the woman at the well. And the other is a very specific lesson that he teaches her regarding worship and some other aspects at the well. And so that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. I want you to begin with the scripture reading that Clayton had for us just a moment ago. I want you to begin with those first three verses, really the first two and a half verses of his reading, verses three through five and the first part of verse 5 in particular. You'll notice that John writes that he, talking about Jesus, left Judea and went away into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now this is very significant because if we take a look at 
at a map of what we would call the Holy Land or the Promised Land or Palestine during Jesus' day, especially if you see it east of the Mediterranean Sea and west of the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River going down to the Dead Sea. If you notice that, you'll notice that there are three areas that are colored on the map in front of you. There is a very large area here to the bottom called Judea, and that's where Jesus was at the beginning of this passage of Scripture. He is then going to make his way up to Galilee, the part at the northern area of Palestine. And sandwiched right between Judea and Galilee is Samaria. Now, it's very important for us to understand the race relations that the Jews had with the Samaritans. They didn't like them very much at all, and we're going to comment on that in just a moment. But they didn't like them to such an extent that although the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, they did not often pass through Samaria. They would try to avoid Samaria altogether, going around it in order to travel from the south to the north or the north to the south. And so it's very important that we kind of set that stage that Jesus is not doing what normal people did. Jesus is not doing what his fellow brothers and sisters amongst the nation of Israel would typically do when traveling in one direction or the other. He's actually going to launch out right through the middle of Samaria. So this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to take a look at three things based on that text that Jesus offered the Samaritan woman. And the very first thing that we're going to find that he offered her, and this is in specifically verses 5 through 9, we're going to see that Jesus offered the Samaritan woman love instead of hate. Jesus offered her love instead of hate. You'll notice in the yellow parentheses, I've got verses 5 through 9. I've also got verse 27, and even though that's not a part of our text, we're going to be referencing that in just a moment. But I want you to notice verses 5 through 9, what happens. There is a city in Samaria called Samaria. We're not talking about the city as verse 5 begins. We're talking, or not talking about the the countryside or the area. Let me stop. I'm going to back up. I'm going to take my breath and I'm going to figure out what it is that I'm trying to say. We are not talking about the city of Samaria. We're talking about the area of Samaria. But although there is a city called Samaria, not too far away from that on that map is a city called Sychar. So we are in the area of Sychar in the region of Samaria. And we see that there is a well there. Now the Old Testament does not record this particular well. We simply know that it was there, and by the providence of the New Testament scriptures and by the inspiration of God delivering this message to us, we know that such a well existed, and we know that such a well was given to Joseph by Jacob. So, therefore, it was known as Jacob's well. It is suggested that there is a well over in this part of the world today that still exists. It is topped off with a stone, but it has an opening in the center big enough for a man to go down in. But this well, although not used anymore, it's either dried up or earthquakes have caused the ground to shift and and it no longer has water in it, but it in fact has been used over the centuries to pile trash in. So it has a lot of rubbish. That well possibly still exists. And it is at this well that this scene takes place at the sixth hour of the day, or for us, that would be 12 o'clock noon. The hot part of the day, the lunchtime part of the day, this is the very reason his disciples have gone off to get food, because it's time to eat. And we see that there is a woman of Samaria, verse 7, who has come to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. To some people, that might sound rude to just walk up to a strange woman and say, give me a drink. A lot of people argue that the Bible is not polite. Well, recognize this, that if the Bible had been written in English according to 21st century 
language, there would probably be a lot of things that might be different. But we've got to remember that Jesus was not being rude, nor was he being condescending, quite the contrary. But he addresses this woman in a culture where what he said was extremely appropriate, not rude at all. He simply says to her, I would like some water. She has the equipment to draw the water out of the well, and she can give him that water. He does not have that. We know that from the text. So he says, woman, give me a drink. And in verse 9, we read that the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? Now, everybody take a look at verse 9 in your Bibles because there is a little parentheses there, a, a parenthetical statement, and it reads, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. If we knew nothing more than what the text reads, we already know that Jesus is doing something different. He is behaving differently than his brethren because he is dealing with a Samaritan. Jesus, born a Jew, raised a Jew, lived a Jew, died a Jew, but he offered something instead of the hatred of prejudice and racism and discrimination, Jesus offered the woman love. He offered her, her his conversation. He offered her his relationship and that time together. He did not walk on by her. He did not look past her. He did not act as if she was less than an animal as, as so many of the day would have properly responded. In this particular passage of Scripture, Jesus acknowledges her. Acknowledges her as the Samaritan that she was. I want you to consider a couple of passages of Scripture, starting with Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. You might remember this passage of Scripture. It is when the gospel has already gone out, starting at the day of Pentecost, to the Jewish world. That was the instruction that was given to the disciples to, to start preaching the gospel, starting in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. So the gospel has been being preached to the nation of Israel for some time at this point. And Peter, who is also a Jew, is about to be given the instruction to go to the Gentile world and start proclaiming the gospel to them. It's going to start at the household of Cornelius. But because of how Peter was raised, because of the prejudice that was instilled within him, because of the disdain that the Jews had for the Samaritans, he had to get a special invitation. He had to receive special instructions from God that what God was requiring of him was not wrong but right. In Acts chapter 10 beginning in verse 9, on the next day as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, once again around noon. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter, but Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. It's very interesting from this story how comparable Peter's experiences are with us. How many times are we instructed to do something that we don't want to do? And then, although we may not see a vision from heaven giving us direct correspondence with God, but we might open up the Bible and we might read a passage that although we're, we don't want to do something, there's the verse of Scripture that says we're supposed to do it. What's our response? Sometimes it's like Peter. We say, but Lord... Kind of reminds me of Moses back in the Old Testament when God called Moses to go into Egypt. 
and to free his people. Moses came up with every excuse in the world, and finally he said, Lord, just send somebody else to do it. That's kind of where Peter is. The Lord is sending a Jew to the house of a Gentile to proclaim the gospel, and this gentleman who has been raised and steeped in racism and prejudice against all people outside of the Jewish nation, he's having a real hard time following this. This idea that he would eat these unclean animals was probably something that was despicable to him. And yet, he was willing to do it. Ultimately, he went to the household of Cornelius because God says, don't call them unholy. Don't call them unclean. They need to hear the truth as well. They need to be saved also. So in this particular passage of Scripture, ultimately Peter gives up his discrimination and he adopts the Christian principle that God loves all of us. And yet, in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, you remember Paul had to rebuke Peter because Peter's prejudice once again reared its ugly head and interfered with the work of the church in the first century. It's sometimes very, very hard for us to give up the mindsets in which we were raised. But if God calls us to make a change, we need to make the change. We need to follow in the example of Jesus who saw this woman as a soul. He did not see her as a different race, but he saw her as someone in need of salvation. And that brings us back to that little verse that I mentioned a moment ago, back in John 4 and verse 27. Not a part of this morning's text, but it's significant nonetheless, because just like we saw that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, the men looked down upon the women. So not only do you have a, a double point in the person that Jesus is confronting at this well, she's both a Samaritan and a woman, but when the disciples show back up in verse 27, we see their sexism. We see their gender bias when they came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. I can remember many times my dad said that Christianity has done more to elevate the status of women than anyone or anything else. Jesus lifted people up. He built them up. He demonstrated how valuable they were to him and to his father. And this is simply one of those situations. He's not only talking to a Samaritan, but he's talking to a woman. You remember in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 13, Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13, do you remember this encounter when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper? A woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Do you think that the same reaction would have happened if Peter had walked in and done this as opposed to this woman? I wonder. What about Judas? We already know that this is the very kind of thing that Judas has a problem with because Judas is a lover of money. But the question is, if Judas had come in and anointed Jesus with this costly perfume, would he have suffered the same criticism from the rest of the disciples? Or was he the one that was leading the charge? You see, Jesus elevated women. Jesus raised them out of the second-class citizenship that so many people in so many nations in so many centuries have kept women down 
to be. It's very interesting. When you talk to people today, even about Christianity, it's kind of interesting how some preachers preach certain sermons. When they talk about the role of the husband and the wife, it, they're very quick to point out, now wives, you need to submit to your husbands. The woman is to submit to the man. She's to be in subjection to the man. That's sometimes a very loud and clearly preached point from some pulpits. But I want you to consider something else that the New Testament teaches. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Peter writes, You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker. And by the way, generally speaking, from a physical standpoint, that's not a sexist thing to say. There's no gender bias when you talk about the stronger sex and the weaker sex from a purely physical standpoint because we know, generally speaking, there is a disproportion between the genders in that area. Gentlemen usually are bigger and stronger than women. That's not an indictment on one or the other. That's just a simple fact. And it's a fact that the inspiration of the Spirit inspires Peter to write. Live with your wife in an understanding way as a weaker vessel. But notice this, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of God, as of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Honor her. You know, when we think about the word honor, we, we think about honor God because of his greatness, because he is elevated above us. Children are to honor their fathers and mothers, the first commandment with a promise. Why? Because they're elevated in authority over children. Well, I want you to think about this word. Husbands, you are to honor your wives. Why? You're not to look down upon her. You're to look up at them. You're to lift them up in such a way as to realize the precious gift that has been given to you by God. Jesus offered the Samaritan woman both racially and from a gender standpoint. He offered her love in a world where I'm sure she found it very commonplace to be on the receiving end of hatred. Let's take a look at another one. Jesus also offered the Samaritan woman life instead of death. We're going to go to verses 10 through 15 to determine this point. Verses 10 through 15. And I want you to notice the language that is used there. Of course, Jesus responds to her in verse 10 and says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, she doesn't know who he is. She doesn't know what it is that he's really even saying here. In fact, she's quite confused at, at what she's at what he's saying because first of all if he is suggesting that he has water to give her she first of all wants to know where's your bucket where's your container how are you gonna dip down into this deep deep well and give me anything you're not prepared for that secondly she wants to know are you greater than Jacob are you greater than one of the patriarchs Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water, verse 13, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Well, obviously, the woman wants some of that. She wants some of the water that will prevent her from ever having to walk who knows how far out of the city to this well and draw it up from such a great depth and carry it all the way back to her family who if her family's like my family, she's going to go through all the work and about, the, about five minutes after she gets back home, she's going to look and the bucket's empty because everybody's already drank it, right? You understand that situation? I can imagine that might be the same as well. She's looking at relief from work, from le relief from all of her hard efforts that go into retrieving this water. She's very interested in what Jesus has to offer, but I don't think she understood it quite yet because she didn't understand exactly who Jesus was. Jesus is not offering H2O. Jesus was offering living water, eternal water, spiritual nourishment. 
You know, it's interesting. When she makes this statement, you know, who are you in essence? When Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says this to you, things might be a little bit different. You know, it was just last chapter in John chapter 3 that we were addressing many, many months ago that Jesus, that John would write, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3.16. And verse 17 would go on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. She may recognize him as a man. She may, not recognize, she may recognize him as a Jew. Not yet has she really figured out how truly special he is. And even then, she's probably going to have no concept that this is God in the flesh talking to her. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15 reads, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That's who was standing before the Samaritan woman. But I want you to consider for just a moment one of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus, when he was preaching this great sermon, mentions something not only about thirst, but about hunger. When he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Once again, he's not talking about physical food. He's not talking about physical drink. What he is talking about is spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst. Those who are famished for the word of God. Those who are desiring his truth. Those who want to live on what he offers us spiritually so that we can live forever with him in a home called heaven. In John chapter 6, and we'll get there in, in a few weeks, but in John chapter 6 I want to throw out a little bit of a caveat that he that John writes for us regarding the same general type of language. In John 6, 33 through 35, Jesus said, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They then said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. They kind of sound like the Samaritan woman. Who wants that living water? They want this living bread. Jesus said to them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Now, although this particular passage seems to be talking about food, spiritual food, he then tacks on that statement about thirsting. He's referring back to that idea of the living water. Stay in the book of John. Go to John chapter 7. Look at verses 37 and 38. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from the, his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That reminds me of a book that had not yet been written at that point, but as John wrote his late, and as John writes this one, there are people who talk about which one came first, and which one came second. But if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the last book of the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 through 17, we get a glimpse into the heavenly realm through John's writing. And he writes in verse 13 of chapter 7 that one of the elders answered, and this is one of the heavenly hosts answered him, saying to me, these who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. The water that will be wiped away in heaven will be tears. The pain of this world will be wiped away. The suffering will not exist there. 
but the water that is present and is present in abundance is the living water that flows from God. It's the living water that is enjoyed by those who are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, by those who are buried in baptism in Jesus Christ so that they can rise to walk in newness of life and fulfill the message and the hope of the gospel. Jesus offered the Samaritan woman with living water. He offered her the opportunity not to stay in sin, but to be washed clean and live with him forever. Now, did she understand all of that? No. And that's why this is just the beginning. This may be our third and final point, but again, this is a part one of part two because we're going to get into some more next week, into the realizations that the Samaritan woman comes to. But I want to end this lesson with this third point. Jesus offered the Samaritan woman insight instead of ignorance. Insight instead of ignorance. Now, as a teacher of the Fishers of Men personal evangelism course, this is the part that I love the most of this story. Because it is in this part that Jesus has already demonstrated how he is just kind of throwing out some seeds of information some limited pieces of knowledge to see if she's interested, to see if she'll bite, to see if she'll follow through by wanting to know more. And in verses 16 through 19, Jesus makes some comments that suddenly reveal to her that he has to know more than he's letting on. He's talking about water of life. He's talking to me as a, an actual human being, and now he is giving me insight into my own life that he can't possibly know. She's never run into this fellow before. She's never seen him before, and yet he's about to explain details of her life that perhaps, based upon her circumstances, she's trying to keep hidden herself. In verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. That's the test. Uh, that's the prompt to see how she responds. And her response is, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. This you've said truly. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're not exactly sure. Is it possible that she had several husbands in a row who died and now she's not married but perhaps living with someone? It's possible. Is it possible that she was married to someone once upon a time and then divorced that husband not for scriptural reasons and therefore remains married to him even though now she has had all of these subsequent relationships? People say, well, wait, how can that happen? Well, brethren, understand something. I had this conversation just this last week. In fact, I had this conversation with two different people this last week, and it was not related to this lesson. But if you go to passages like Matthew chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, one of the hallmark New Testament passages on the subject of divorce and remarriage, you will understand, especially if you look at the greater text, verses 3 through 12, what God's position is on marriage and divorce. First and foremost, one man, one woman, together for life. That's how it was always intended to be. That's how it's still meant to be. In the middle of that, there is one exception given, and one, one and only one exception, why God will approve a divorce. It's not that he's in favor of it. Remember, God hates divorce. But the only one that he will allow is described for us in verse 9. But I want you to notice what happens in verses 7 through 9 of Matthew chapter 19. The critics of Jesus, the people who were trying to bring him down, always trying to test him, trap him, uh, trip him up in some way so that he would not have the popularity of the people, these religious leaders of the day are really trying to set the trap for him. And they say to him in verse 7, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. This is what's interesting. People don't understand that the Bible talks about two 
kinds of divorce. One is what we might call a governmental divorce versus a godly divorce. One might be called a, a civil divorce as opposed to a scriptural divorce, however you want to define it. But I think we all understand what that's talking about because we live in a society that will allow you to put away your spouse for any and every reason. You can go down to the courthouse, you can file the paperwork, and if your wife burned the toast and that's why you're going to divorce her, or if your husband put the toilet paper on the roll upside down and you're going to divorce him, you can be granted that divorce. That government divorce, that civil divorce, you can, be, you can do that. And although Moses was a spiritual leader of the nation of Israel, he was also the civil or governmental leader of that nation. And there were some things that he allowed to do from a civil standpoint, the people to do, that God never said was okay. Verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another, commits adultery. You see, God has only granted one cause for anyone ever to divorce another person and then, in the eyes of God, be allowed to marry again. And that is if your spouse has been guilty of fornication. In this particular verse, verse 9, he says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another, a lot of people say, well, if he divorced her, then they're divorced. No, 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 no. This is one versus the other. You see, if you pursue a divorce that is not consistent with the law laid out in Scripture, and then you marry another one, and yet you are still married in the eyes of God to the first spouse, you can understand why God why Jesus himself called it adultery. Look at Mark 6, verses 17 and 18. This is exactly what happened with John the baptizer, a person who literally had his head removed from his body because he preached this doctrine. In Mark 6, verses 17 and 18, Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. How can you marry somebody else's wife? Well, I'll tell you how you can do it. You can do it governmentally. You can do it civilly. You can do it according to the laws of the land, but you can never do it according to the law of God. And that's what's going on here. You see, Herod has power, and he evidently has so much governmental power that he has taken his own brother's wife and married her. You know what John said in verse 18? He said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod could have very easily said, but I'm the law. Of course it's lawful. John's not talking about the government. God's talk John's talking about God. I suddenly just got the microphone working. Don't know what I did. And so, needless to say, <laughs> I don't know what just happened, but uh, needless to say, this is the distinction that we see in Scripture. Whether this woman knew what was going on or did not know what's going on, she does not seem to be open about it. And as such, in this particular situation, as such, he calls Herod out on it and says, that's not right. Well, suddenly, this woman is figuring out that this man is special. She may not still know that he's the Son of God. She may not recognize him as the prophesied Messiah, but she does recognize him as a prophet. She says, clearly, you know something that I don't, and maybe these are some things I need to hear. Albert Barnes, in his commentary, defines the prophet that is used in this statement when she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. He says, this is one sent from God and who understood her life. The word here does not denote one who foretells future events, but one who knew her heart and life and who must therefore have come from God. She did not yet suppose him to be the Messiah, but knew he was special. John chapter 4 and verse 44, Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor even in his own country. That was an allusion to himself. 
John chapter 6 and verse 14 reads, Therefore when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. John chapter 7 verses 40 and 41 reads, Some of the people therefore when they heard these words were saying, This certainly is the prophet. There are people who recognize Jesus as being a mouthpiece for God. The information that he had, the insight that he shared, could only come from God in heaven above. Some people move beyond that. Verse 41 of chapter 7 reads, Others were saying, this is the Christ. They're acknowledging him, in other words, him to be the anointed one, the king, the coming Messiah. And yet others still said, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? You see, they had their own expectations of who Jesus ought to be, where he ought to come from, what kind of clothes he ought to have, what kind of power he ought to possess. They had their own ideas. But Jesus was different. And Jesus did not want the Samaritan woman to remain in the dark. And he used comments and he used questions to garner interest so that she might want to know more. And one of the things that we say in Fishers of Men is that a person will always learn more regarding information they ask for than information that is freely given. Sometimes we say to students in the school of preaching, if you get up in front of a congregation like this and you just give them knowledge, you just give them information without ever challenging them to think, then they're never going to learn as much as if you ask them a question. You give them a seed of thought that maybe they might meditate upon or search for the answers regarding in the days and weeks to come. That's what we want to do because that's the example that's set for us by the perfect teacher, the perfect preacher, Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, John would write, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in this, and we who are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. I thought that was an interesting passage of Scripture because he gave us understanding, but not a one of us had all of the understanding of the Bible dumped upon us all at one time. We, perhaps, if you were raised in a Christian home, you received some of this teaching as a child through Bible story books or Bible classes. Maybe if you were never taught the truth until you came to, to, become, came to be an adult, maybe somebody had some kind of influence on you to where you got interested in this thing called Christianity. At the end of this morning's lesson, the Samaritan woman is very interested in Jesus. She still may not know fully who he is, but she knows he's special. And she knows he has information that might just be helpful to her and her salvation. And that's where we'll pick up next week. But this week, I want you to consider con the conclusion verse as 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Will the Samaritan woman overcome sin? Will we overcome sin? Only, first and foremost, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember how Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they gave all kinds of answers to his question. Then he said, who do you say that I am? You remember what Peter said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, when he's taught enough to know he wants to be a child of God, he wants to have his sins washed away and even looks down and says, look, here's water, what's preventing me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, I believe that the Samaritan woman will ultimately come to this conclusion. She's on a journey. And that journey, like every journey, is going to end in one of two ways, either in our faith or our lack of faith. 
one that's going to result in eternal life, one that's going to result in eternal death. But the choice, as always, is ours. So the question this morning is, what lesson have you learned from Jesus and the Samaritan woman? What lesson have you learned from the encounter of these two nearly 2,000 years ago at the edge of Jacob's well? What are you going to learn about what Jesus offered this woman, offering her love rather than hatred, offering her life rather than death, offering her insight into the eternal truth of God's will versus allowing them to stay in ignorance? You know, that's our job today. That's our challenge today. That's our commission. When Jesus said to his disciples, and he thus says to us, his followers today, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all of creation. Why? So that they might have insight over ignorance. So that they might have knowledge that they can then weigh, they can then choose, and if so, choose obedience to God's will. That's our challenge this morning. Our challenge is to be children of God. Be faithful children of God and share with others the knowledge of how they can do the same. Relying upon the cleansing blood of Jesus, relying upon the grace and mercy of the Father, but the choice is ours. What choice will you make while we stand and sing?